Um, a huge warm welcome to everybody here. I am Lisa Hamilton, and I am the Law Society President for 2022. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you and thank you for being here for our fourth uh, Rule of Law Lecture. This was originally planned to be an annual event, but then the pandemic sort of uh, botched all plans there. And uh, for the last two years, we've been interrupted. So we're very excited to have the speaker and have our fourth uh, lecture in, this, in the Rule of Law series. Um, it is really, I have to say, um, come on in and make yourselves welcome. It is really wonderful to look out in the audience and see so many people in person. I think um, I, for one, have really missed that. And I know there's a, a welcome to uh, those, of, those of you appearing virtually and watching virtually. Um, really, really nice to see you all out. Uh, we weren't really sure when we planned this uh, how many would be appearing virtually versus in person, but it's really wonderful to see those of you in person enjoying some snacks and some beverages and, and sitting back to enjoy the lecture. A uh, little bit about the rule of law. The rule of law is fundamental to the protection of the rights and freedoms of all Canadians. And perhaps now it's more important than it's ever been uh, to, uh, than, as, as we look across the last few years and we witness the erosion in countries where the rule of law is either struggling or non-existent. In order to preserve the rule of law, we must understand it and commit steadfastly to it. The Law Society initiated these um, lectures about the rule of law to highlight the importance of the rule of law and the role that an independent bar has in maintaining the rule of law. The Law Society's duty is to protect the public interest in the administration of justice by protecting and preserving the rights and freedoms of all persons. And nothing better protects those rights and freedoms than the rule of law. Over the course of the first four uh, lectures, and some of you have, have likely attended those, uh, we've had the good fortune to have very interesting and thought-provoking lectures from extraordinary guests. And this evening certainly promises to uphold that tradition. So before I hand it over to our, um, our speaker, I'm going to introduce a host for the evening who's going to moderate the discussion and say a few words about our moderator, Jackie McQueen, QC. Jackie is a treasured family law colleague of mine, and she is a partner with Aaron Gordon Dakin Nordlinger, which is one of the top firms in Vancouver for family law. She became a bencher in January of 2019, and she's a member of our executive committee, and she also chairs our practice standards committee, as well as the Eth ethics and lawyer independence advisory committee. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jackie to uh, moderate this exciting evening. Over to you, Jackie. Thanks very much, President Hamilton, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm sure you, like me, are very excited to hear from our distinguished speaker this evening. And, uh, and it's such a pleasure to see people in person and to be able to hold an event like this with our colleagues uh, and hopefully have a very interesting conversation. In terms of the format for the evening, I will do a brief introduction and I'll try not to repeat too many of the things that Lisa has already said, and then I'll turn it over to our speaker who will speak for uh, 20 to 25 minutes. And then we will have the opportunity to engage in conversation uh, for people who are attending both here and online to ask questions. And we'll manage those questions as they come up. Uh, and I also may have a few questions that I will address to our speaker uh, as well. So hopefully we can have a really robust discussion about these issues, which I think are fundamentally important. Uh, this is our first post-pandemic event, and uh, I think that uh, it, we're so used to being in the Zoom world that I do encourage you to get up on your feet and, and go to the microphone and ask a question. We will have some online questions as well from people who are attending remotely. 
I do just want to say a word or two about the rule of law uh, generally, and President Hamilton has already touched on these issues, but we can't forget how fundamental the rule of law is to our constitutional framework and to our democracy. It requires the equal application of laws to every person, whatever their social or political standing, their identity, their level of wealth, profession, trade, education level. In a democratic society, operating with the rule of law, privilege should, be, should not be a passport to avoid sanction, nor should the lack of privilege attract penalty. We can all imagine a world where the rule of law is absent. In fact, we can see those examples looking around every day. We all, in our privileged position as lawyers or as individuals who are interested in these issues, we have an obligation to advocate and be vigilant about rule of law issues. For the justice system to work, everyone must be able to get meaningful legal advice. Lawyers need to be able to speak candidly with their clients and confidentially advise their clients. In all cases, that must happen without fear of favor or threat of sanction. A person charged with a crime or a litigant in a civil proceeding must know that the justice system is going to uh, determine the outcome of their matter by objective application of the law and not by the pull of public opinion or other factors. Our speaker tonight will speak about these ideas and we will have the opportunity, opportunity to engage directly with her. Marie Hennen is a household name and by any measure is an icon in the Canadian legal profession. She has been described by her colleagues as fierce and brilliant. She is one of Canada's most prominent criminal defense lawyers and her work on high profile cases has garnered her national attention and high regard. A staunch defender of due process and the search for the truth, Ms. Hennen has used her profile to combat misconceptions about lawyers and the justice system and to articulate why a well-functioning justice system is crucial to a healthy democracy. She is the founding partner at Hennen Hutchinson LLP, which is recognized by Canadian Lawyer Magazine as one of Canada's top 10 litigation boutiques. She is an unapologetic advocate, embodying the phrase, no guts, no glory, which is apparently prominently displayed in her office. She's been interviewed by CBC's The National, written for The Globe and Mail, and is a sought after speaker. She's also the author of a memoir, Nothing But the Truth, which is both a deeply personal account of her and her family's story and an expression of her strongly held views on the most pressing issues of our times. We are greatly honored to have her here today. Please join me in welcoming Marie Hennen. Thank you very much, President Hamilton and, and Jackie, and I look forward uh, to speaking with all of you that have uh, braved it out uh, today. Uh, as lawyers, our job is to pose questions. A litigator's tool is really how you phrase a question. And if you phrase a question one way, you'll get one answer. And if you phrase it a different way, you'll get a different answer. Judges determine and define the scope of their judgments by framing the question they are going to answer. So the question that you ask matters as much as the answer you give. So today, in giving this lecture, there were a number of questions that were posed for me to answer. And they were, when you hire a lawyer, do you expect them to represent your interests and yours alone? If the public believes you are guilty of a crime or that your cause is wrong, should you still be able to hire a lawyer? What would happen if we decide that the wrong people or causes shouldn't be allowed to have legal representation? These are really all uh, different ways of asking the very same thing. 
Distilled to their essence, we are once again faced with the same question. Why do you do what you do? I mean, really, why do you do it? Not in the I'm really interested in our justice system, so where does the role of a defense lawyer fit in? That's not what's being asked at all. The real question is how can you be so amoral, or worse still, immoral? It is the wrong question. It is a question that tells us a great deal about why it is being asked and where we are in our democratic process and society. It's really worse than a wrong question. It's a dangerous one. I personally don't know anyone who went to law school, struggled through seven years of education, incurred all sorts of debt with the goal of doing the most immoral job that they could possibly think of for 30 years. It definitely didn't even occur to me to question my choice of profession, or my morality, for that matter. Just as I expect, it did not occur to most young law students who were just trying to figure their way through. Really and truly, nobody asked me this question for years. But nowadays, it seems that it is the only question people want to ask. Lawyers, heck, the whole justice system is put under a moral microscope to be dissected to ensure we really are human and humane. It's as though we're all on a yellow brick road together trying to find out, find out do lawyers really have a brain and courage and a heart? We do, we always have. When the public asks these questions, it's fair because our profession is opaque and we in the justice system do not do a very good job of explaining it. There's a good and productive conversation to be had with the public about how the justice system works, about what we are trying to do, how we can do things better. But these questions are not the dominion only of members of the public, not at all. Some of the greatest fomenters of disinformation are people who really should know better. The executive branch, who should, probably before they assume office, remind themselves of the checks and balances so fundamental to our exceedingly and increasingly fragile democracy, should understand. Because it is the executive branch of government who appears not to understand what the role of lawyers and judges are. It appears that they do not want to protect something that is so core to our democratic operation. And if the politicians, the executive branch, aren't the ones to champion it rather than denigrate it when it interferes with political ambitions, well then, sadly, folks, we've got, as they said in one movie, a failure to communicate. Now, I am not chicken little. The sky really is falling. If you thought our core democratic principles are on solid ground, well then you've not been reading or watching the news over the last several years. With stolen elections, rampant misinformation, stormings of the Capitol, trucker convoys in Ottawa, and all this as Ukrainian nationals are literally picking up arms and dying to protect their democratic way of life. Here in North America, we take it all for granted. We don't understand it. The left and the right have used and abused the rhetoric. I was driving through Toronto before I came here a couple of days ago, and I came by a protest uh, bellowing through a megaphone. I think it was remnants of the Ottawa convoy uh, because they were vowing to assert and protect their freedoms. And I thought to myself, but here you are, unobstructed and uninterrupted, allowed to say exactly what you want on a megaphone, where you want. If that is not freedom, I'm not really sure what is. You can demonstrate in the street. And if the government doesn't hear you, you will be heard in a courtroom where any challenge you wish to advance will be heard. And it will be advanced by a lawyer who is not immoral at all. And more importantly, the government will have to answer you in a courtroom. So I have to say, I just don't understand it. Protesting is the very exercise of democratic freedom. You know how I know? 
Well, I know this because over 10,000 protesters in Russia, people protesting the war in Ukraine are purportedly arrested and in jail. They did not get to express themselves or their freedoms without consequence. So why do we not know a good thing when we see it? Well, let's just take a bit of a tour together over the last three or four weeks, which I confess have been making my head explode. We don't have to go far before we reach our first destination, Washington, DC. Over the last week, a US Supreme Court nominee, the first black woman ever nominated to this position, was subjected to Senate confirmation hearings. I say subjected because if you watched even a small bit of the hearings, you could use no other word to describe the display. Katanji Brown Jackson, a Harvard graduate, a lawyer, and a respected judge. A person that, but for these hearings, had received bipartisan support. And during these confirmation hearings, she was asked a range of things. Does she accept that a fetus feels pain at 20 weeks? Does she subscribe to critical race theory? Could she define the meaning of the word woman? The questions were stupid. And they really were designed uh, to figure out how she would decide, with no case before her, no facts. So instead of celebrating the impartiality of the judiciary, the senators were attempting to establish it. But the most sustained attacks were her, on her occupation. You see, Katanji Brown Jackson had made a very fatal mistake. She had been a defense lawyer a public defender for some time. And this was where her very character and morality was most attacked. Senator Ted Cruz started right at the beginning, quite extraordinary. He started with her academic law school papers. Oh yes, she was involved in the Harvard Law Review, but that pre prestigious accomplishment really paled in comparison to her audacity, her immorality, in writing a scholarly constitutional paper on Megan's laws. We have similar laws here in Canada, Christopher's laws. These are laws dealing with sex offender registries. And in 1996, when Katanji Brown Jackson was writing her law school paper for the Harvard Law Review, these laws were new. Their constitutionality was very much a question of academic debate. And so Senator Cruz asked her this. I also see a record of activism and advocacy as it concerns sexual predators that stems back decades that is concerning. You wrote your note on the Harvard Law Review on sex crimes. You wrote prevention versus punishment towards a principal distinction in the restraint of released sex offenders. And in it, you argue, and I quote, a recent spate of legislation purports to regulate released sex offenders by requiring them to register with local law enforcement officials, notify community members of their presence, undergo DNA testing, and submit to civil commitment for an indefinite term. Although many courts and commentators herald these laws as valid regulatory measures, others reject them as punitive enactments that violate the rights of individuals that have already been sanctioned for their crimes. Under existing doctrine, the constitutionality of sex offender statutes depends on their characterization as essentially preventative rather than punitive. You argue, he roared, that they should be viewed as punitive and are unconstitutional. When the judge tries to engage in an intelligent explanation of the complex constitutional questions that arose in the four components of Megan's law, and you'll know that in 2020, our Supreme Court dealt with and struck down elements of the constitutionality of similar laws. When she tried to explain that what she really was trying to define was whether these laws were preventative and hence constitutional or punitive and hence unconstitutional, he didn't hear it. The academic principled response did not deter Senator Cruz. If the views you advocated were accepted, civil commitment laws across the country would be struck down releasing sexual predators, and under that argument, community notification and DNA bank laws could well be struck down as well. Is that an outcome that should concern people, he asked? Let's take civil commitment laws. Right now, the UCLA Williams Institute estimates that more than 6,300 sex offenders are currently detained. 
If the views you advocate were accepted, those 6,300 sex offenders would be released into the public. Is that something that should concern people? The question was bad. The person asking it was worse. Senator Cruz, you should know, was a Harvard colleague of the judge. He was legally educated. A lawyer was asking these questions, impugning the character of a qualified judge, not because she didn't understand the law, but because in law school, she had questioned the constitutionality of a piece of legislation. And for that, she was to be held responsible for potentially releasing 6,300 sex offenders into the community. That is what he wanted the public to understand about that lawyer and judge. But it was not only her law school record that was attacked. Senator Lindsey Graham continued the attack. He questioned her work as a public defender and a lawyer who represented Guantanamo Bay detainees challenging indefinite detention without trial. Quote, the American people deserve a system that can keep terrorists off the battlefield. They deserve a system that understands the difference between being at war and in crime. Do you consider 9-11 a terrible, tragic event? Would you consider it an act of war, he asked? Did you argue in an amicus brief that we cannot hold enemy combatants indefinitely and that you need to try them and release them? She responded, my clients made that argument. Do you agree with that argument, he said? My job was to make my clients' arguments. That didn't deter him. In one of the briefs, he said, you argued that the executive branch couldn't do periodic reviews of dangerousness. They would have to make a decision of trying or releasing them. When you sign on to an amicus brief, does it now become your argument? It does not, she said. When you are an attorney, you are representing a client in amicus briefs. You sign on to this brief making this argument, but you say it's not your position? I mean, why would you do that? If it's not your position, why would you take a client that has a position? Voluntarily, nobody was making you do this, he asked. If the court had taken the position that you argued in that brief that you signed upon, we'd have to release these people. You're putting America in an untenable position, he said. If you try to do this in World War II, they'd run you out of town he said to the lawyer arguing an appellate brief. Respectfully, Senator, she responded, when you have clients, whether they pay you or not, you represent their positions before the court. But what made you join the cause, he pressed. Did you feel okay adopting that cause? She tried to explain it. She said, Senator, even as a judge now, I need to determine lawfulness or unlawfulness by hearing both sides. I need to receive information from opposing views. That is what a lawyer does. He said, well, I get that's what a judge does, but I'm asking you to explain the position you took as a lawyer regarding the law of war. If that brief had been accepted, we wouldn't be able to fight the war. The question was bad. The questioner was even worse. Lindsey Graham, you might know, is a trained lawyer. He worked as a defense lawyer for JAG in the Army. He was also a county lawyer. He knew better. But that was not all. Her record sentencing child pornographers was a significant point of attack. In her 10 years, she had done all of 10 pornography cases. The 10 cases were pulled and pull, put out on a dramatic Bristol board. So they had what the sentencing guidelines were and then what she imposed as sentence. And Senator Cruz then goes through this very melodramatic analysis calculating the percentage that she imposed below what the prosecutor had asked in each of those cases. This was very powerful stuff, not. When she tried to explain that sentencing requires you to consider the offense, the victim, and shockingly, the offender before you, and that not all offenders are the same. She was, after all, head of the Sentencing Commission, so she knew one or two things about it. When she tried to explain that the law requires you to consider all of the circumstances, when she tried to explain that these numbers didn't reflect all the information she had about the accused, <coughs> Cruz asked her this. Do you believe when the prosecutor asked for 24 months and you sentenced this person to three months, 
the voice of the child is heard? The theme was clear. Her work in criminal law, her work as a public defender, her work defending Guantanamo Bay detainees, her work as an appellate lawyer filing briefs on behalf of defendants or organizations that challenged laws, her work in sentencing in criminal cases, all those facts were pointed to in order to demonstrate that she is morally bankrupt, that she sides with war criminals, that she sides with child pornographers, that she endangers the very welfare and safety of citizens. And all of those questions were asked by legislatures, by the executive branch, by people who purportedly defend core democratic values. What were they asking? Well, they were asking the questions we are asking here. When you hire a lawyer, do you expect them to represent your interests and yours alone? If the public believes you are guilty of a crime or that your cause is wrong, should you still be able to hire a lawyer? Ketanji Brown Jackson answered those questions, but they are questions that should never have been asked at all in a democratic society. But that's not all. In London, in the UK, legislators, members of parliament have recently called lawyers and law firms amoral. In early September 2020, a member of the public attempted to commit an act of violence at a law firm the prosecutors alleged that the motivation was the firm's involvement in representing people facing government deportation. But the person hadn't come up with this theory all on their own. He'd been handed the theory by UK government ministers. Days before, Home Secretary Patel had tweeted that home office removals continue, be, continue to be frustrated by activist lawyers. Activist lawyers were to blame for blocking and delaying the removal of migrants. Philip Rodney, a former member of the IBA Senior Lawyers Committee Advisory Board said, and I quote, I can't recall in more than 40 years of practice seeing that sort of language being used by government in an attempt to discredit lawyers who are just doing their jobs. He said that it was breathtaking that a government channel should seek to disparage as activists lawyers who work within the limits of the law to uphold the rights of those whom they represent. The ability to scrutinize executive powers and protect the interests of our clients is an essential part of the rule of law. Undeterred, the Home Secretary then gave a speech in which she denounced lefty lawyers working in the asylum system. And that was roundly supported by the Prime Minister Boris Johnson who accused lefty human rights lawyers of causing the system to be broken. The result was that in the UK, law firms working on immigration cases received more threats. The International Bar Association issued a statement that we remind the United Kingdom of the UN's basic principles, obligation for governments to, quote, ensure that lawyers are able to perform all of their professional functions without intimidation, hindrance, harassment, or improper interference. The state-endorsed rhetoric was dangerous. It always is. Recently, lawyers challenging sanctions imposed against Russians in the UK have been named and shamed as being immoral by ministers. This notwithstanding that in 2012, the then mayor of London invited London's oligarchs to sue in the courts of London the minister was Boris Johnson. If you keep asking these questions, at some point you can convince yourself that there is only one answer, or worse still, you convince the public to buy into a narrative that is false. You convince the public that the legal system, the independence of lawyers and judges is here to frustrate elected officials and is not democratic. And when you have stripped one of the fundamental principles of our democracy, when you've crippled it and delegitimized it, called into question the moral integrity of those who work with it, well, what happens next? You stop asking any questions, and this happens. In 2021, in Russia, the opposition leader, Alexei Navalny's lawyer, Ivan Pavlov, was arrested by the Russian Federal Security Service. A group of lawyers announced that this arrest was connected to his professional activity. 
And they said, we believe these actions by law enforcement are aimed exclusively at scaring Ivan and his colleagues in order to force them to reject an active position in defending their clients. And then on March 22, 2022, just a few weeks ago, Navalny's lawyers were detained by police while giving media interviews after the latest court session. Olga Mikolova and Vadim Kobzas were arrested in front of the media and driven away by police for reasons that were never made clear. You see, in Russia, they don't even ask the question. The immorality assumed in the question, how could you defend? How could you do what you do? That moral judgment, we have to remind ourselves, depends on who is asking the question of who is in power. If a Republican asks you, how could you defend? They are judging your moral character because you defended Gitmo detainees or people charged with various crimes like child pornography. If a Democrat or liberal asks you, how could you defend? They are judging your moral character because you defend protesters that have stormed the Capitol or who have had a convoy in Ottawa or people charged with crimes like sexual assault. If the UK asks you how you could defend, they're judging your moral character because you challenge the government sanctions or represent refugees. It matters who asks the question. The very question is flawed because in the question is an assumption of morality, that those working in the legal system have a compromised moral compass. And the question ignores what our very role is. If you assail the independence of the bar, if you forget the purpose of an independent judiciary, the check and balance on government, you delegitimize our constitutional democracy. And then you don't need to ask the question at all, because whoever is in power knows the answer that they want. You don't ask the question at all. You just arrest the lawyer, as happened in Russia, as happens to defense lawyers in China and Iraq and Iran, or you arrest the judges, as happened in India. Asking those questions, legitimizing that assumption of moral ambiguity is the first and very dangerous step. And when it is asked by lawmakers, it is even more so. So perhaps, just maybe, we should start asking some of the right questions. For example, how can we improve the legal system? How can we make sure that everyone, the poor and the marginalized, the racialized are vigorously and fairly represented, even if the cause is unpopular. Well, in British Columbia, actually, some of the right questions have been asked. And this miracle happens that when you ask the right question, you start getting some of the right answers. A contribution of $8.19 million to BC Legal Aid is a good answer to the right question. Ask the right question and you get the right answer. So look, I can't end this lecture without answering the questions you asked me once and for all. When you hire a lawyer, do you expect them to represent your interest and yours alone? Yes, that is our job. If the public believes you are guilty of a crime or that your cause is wrong, should you still be able to hire a lawyer? Yes, nobody can be deprived of representation and the right to, to have their case heard before an impartial judge. What would happen if we decide that the wrong people or causes shouldn't be allowed to have legal representation? We would give up our very democracy and put ourselves on a path that we will forever regret. Thank you. I do have a few questions. I'm sure I would rather hear your questions than mine, but uh, we can certainly engage in some conversation while you guys are getting warmed up and ready to ask your own questions. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is this idea of misinformation. And you touched in your talk about how some of that misinformation is actually coming from the executive branch or the legislative branch and places that we expect to know better. And I'm interested in knowing your views about what type of misinformation is most dangerous and how that misinformation impacts the justice system in particular. 
Well, I think that, you know, that there's misinformation everywhere because we are working and communicating, I think, in an environment that we did not anticipate in the context of social media. And the, the difficulty with social media is it's impossible to uh, understand who it is that's giving you information or expressing an opinion. So it, it's very difficult to know the qualifications of the person who's speaking. And when you combine that with the fact that what we are directed to is often curated by these companies, it's not a conspiracy theory, we know that they, they curate your content, you know, you tend to be directed to people that are just going to reinforce whatever your views are. So, you know, that, that is something that we cannot control, but we can control ourselves uh, because we can inquire, we can choose to look further, we can choose to not believe every tweet that we read. But I, I think the, the bigger concern for me is the thing that I talked about, which is that recently, uh, really across numerous democratic countries, there has been a willingness uh, of politicians to engage in both judge and lawyer bashing. Um, and, you know, in, in one case, for example, where a, where a politician said, I'm legitimate and, and the court isn't, which is uh, astounding because you must have missed grade seven history um, to not understand. So there's this assumption that elected officials, and this goes back to the rise, I think, of populism, that elected officials are more legitimate than the judicial arm, the, the unelected um, component. And that just ignores ignores exactly what the judiciary is there for and what lawyers are there for, which is to protect unpopular minority rights against whoever is in power. Um, so I find that misinformation the, the most troubling, the willingness of politicians to, to denigrate the justice system. And most of the time, uh, they, they just don't know what they're talking about. I mean, they don't, actually don't know the subject matter they're talking about, which is a, a real disservice to the public. I think that's a fascinating point, and I'd love to pick up on it because as I was driving back from a spring break holiday with my kids the other day, I saw a billboard as I was driving into Vancouver about how judges ought to be elected. And I think that it is a conversation that we have from time to time about whether uh, elected officials, be they judges in, in various places where judges are elected or elected officials in the legislature, are somehow more legitimate than appointed officials. And I'm interested in knowing what you think, uh, what, what impact it has on the public perception of the legitimacy of the court that we have judges appointed by government. Well, the, the problem with that is that while the government expresses the will of the majority, notwithstanding that they're supposed to take into account the, the, uh, the interests of uh, their, their other constituents, they are driven by their, their constituency, which is the, the majority that put them there. Um, and if you have that same dynamic for judges, what's going to happen is you're going to have elections that are run uh, based on what you believe uh, is a platform of that judge, what you think, the way you think they're going to decide. And that would mean that the people who have the greatest power, uh, the majority, will uh, elect judges that are, are simpatico to their beliefs. So in, in the South, uh, I think you would see a lot of judges that are white judges, and uh, you would not want to be uh, coming before them necessarily. But if you're running on, and we know this, we don't have to guess in Canada, we really, again, should take some time to do the homework. Uh, when you look at how elections are run, um, judges are either appointed for um, their views, they are taken down if they are viewed as being soft on crime, there are massive campaigns. Uh, the campaigns run to stop a judge from being reelected. It's fascinating. I write about this. Are often run by large corporations that have no interest in criminal justice, but, for example, don't want that judge adjudicating a case they have coming through the system. So, um, it, the the uh, ads and the attempts to take these judges out are often quite nefarious. You don't want that. I mean, you just don't want that. You shouldn't know how a judge is going to rule and. In Canada, if you take a look at how our Supreme Court functions and how the U.S. Supreme Court functions, our court, no matter who elects them, have repeatedly, uh, or who's appointed them, have repeatedly rejected government legislation and smacked them down and, and shut them down or rejected. Um, so there's no way for us to guess, and that's been my experience in the Supreme Court, how they're going to rule, no matter who it was that appointed them. 
but you can guess if you go to the Supreme Court in the United States. And that's really unfortunate because, because it becomes another political battleground and the courts are not supposed to be political. They really aren't, they're supposed to be apolitical. Uh, so I am very opposed to, um, to elected judges. Mm. A little closer to home, and I, I think that we often think in Canada that the rule of law, law is pretty functional here. Uh, and uh, last year, the year prior, in our rule of law committee, we actually talked about prime minister mandate letters. Uh, and in particular, mandate letters around mandatory education in certain areas for federal judges in Canada. Right. And uh, it's the kind of thing that most people look at and think, well, that's good. Judges should know about sexual assault and sure. they should know about those things. But are there rule of law implications to that kind of mandated training? And, and there was, of course, opposition from federal judges to that idea of mandated training. Can you comment on that? I can, because there is that training. I mean, it wasn't like this government all of a sudden woke up and thought this would be a great idea. What they did is see a tweet and react to it. But if you had looked at what the National Judicial uh, Institute does in educating judges. That is part of the training, just at, you know, dealing with sexual assault, dealing with uh, racialized offenders, dealing particularly with indigenous offenders. So there is a lot of education that goes in and there is nothing wrong with judges being educated. You know, if that was the motivation, if it was genuinely a, a desire to elevate the, the education and awareness of judges uh, in, in dealing with certain types of cases, that would be incredible. I'd have no problem with it. I just don't trust the motive at all. I don't, you know, because uh, these cases have been decided for years and there was really no interest. And why were they not issuing a mandate letter for all sorts of other education that judges need? Uh, so I don't think it interferes with the rule of law. I just think it's political pandering and it's obnoxious. I'd like to, to go back to an area that you talked about a lot in your lecture, which I think is really important, and that's this association of the lawyer with their client's cause. And I've seen, and I'm not going to be able to come up with the statistic, but I've seen uh, concern raised about the lack of people, the lack of law students coming forward wanting to do criminal defense, for sure. example. And I wonder if that kind of morality play that you're talking about, uh, if that plays into that. And how do we, as a legal profession, combat that and get people to recognize the validity of, of that role and the importance of that role? Well, that's a great question, because I think the law society and regulation Regulators have a very important function in public education. And so, for example, hypothetically, if a woman was representing a high profile sexual assault case, I've never. <laughs> um, and there were attacks on the fact that a female was doing that uh, and attacks on the role of a defense lawyer, that would be a good opportunity for law societies across the country to speak up. Uh, I think that did not happen in this hypothetical scenario. And so, what did happen uh, is not that her feelings were hurt, because I could care less, but that young female lawyers and young lawyers were watching this and thought to themselves, many spoke to me and said, I, I don't, I don't want to go through that. I don't want to be subjected to that. What an awful message to send to young law students, male and female, and what an awful message to send to members of the public to not stand up and explain what it is we're doing, how the court functions, what the defense lawyer's job is, what the crown attorney, what the judges, these are conversations that when you engage with members of the public, it, it's fascinating. They, they want to engage, they want to know. And then the criticism, and there can be criticism, of course, is informed, at least they understand. You know, it, it would be like walking into an operatory and going, you know what, I don't think you should perform surgery that way. Well, I think you might want to go to med school first, or you might want to ask a few questions and say, hey, why are you doing it that way? So, you know, I think our, we have a very important role, both as, as lawyers and most importantly as regulators, to, to engage with the public and explain what our justice system is and what it is that we do. And we really have to be cognizant of the message that we are sending to, uh, to young lawyers who are, are and can be deterred from, from entering this profession and can be intimidated. And this intimidation is not hypothetical. You know, lawyers all over are often intimidated when they're taken on representing, for example, the, the Guantanamo Bay detainees back in 9-11. Many of you were too young to recall. Those lawyers were vilified, vilified for representing them. And then there's a few Hollywood movies and we now think, oh, that's an incredibly noble thing to do because Jodie Foster 
played one of those lawyers. But back in, you know, just after 9-11, when lawyers were saying, this is horrible, but what's happening is unconstitutional, the way we're dealing with them, they were vilified. You know, making a murderer, those, I don't know if any of you saw that documentary on Netflix, those two lawyers, and I, I had the opportunity to chat with them, couldn't get a meal in that small town because they were treated so badly. And then their, their Netflix starts. So <coughs> we have to, we have to engage and we have to understand that lawyers do face that intimidation, some places worse than others. Uh, you know, where I, I went and taught in, in China with defense lawyers for, for a few days, and they were terrified of being arrested in representing their clients. So there's a range of intimidation. Uh, and we, as regulators and uh, as lawyers, should really resist it. And it's really ugly when that intimidation and criticism comes from members that are elected officials. Mm -hmm. I think there's a thread there to pick up on around professional regulation <coughs> generally and the importance of independence. Uh, and I know that on the committee, on the rule of law committee, we've talked about uh, how do you ensure the independence of the bar and how do you ensure that you don't have a situation where government is able to, as is the situation in Hong Kong right now, essentially remove the licenses of people who are practicing contrary to the government. And uh, so I'd be interested in knowing your take on professional regulation and the independence of the bar in that respect. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's, it's absolutely fundamental. I think when the government seeks to uh, intervene in the regulation of, of lawyers, uh, it is um, a slippery slope. Look, we have judges who are appointed by government and are regulated, but there are all sorts of um, councils, uh, judicial councils that deal with them and, and govern their behavior. The government has to be hands off. They have to be arm's length because our role, the very role of lawyers is often to challenge the government. And so you cannot give the person that you're challenging or the institution you're challenging control over your voice and over your license. Uh, I, I just think that is a very, very dangerous precedent. And the government must always be mindful of being at arm's length from the judiciary, from the justice system, from Crown attorneys. I mean, I'm not a fan of, of restricting Crown attorneys' discretion either mm -hmm. or constraining it. Um, uh, they have to stand back and allow the justice system to be unimpeded by political interference. Mm -hmm. we, we, of course, are mandated to regulate in the public interest. And, and I think there's a general understanding that the public has many interests. Sure. It's hard, hard to say that there's one particular public interest. And in terms of public representation on regulatory uh, bodies, do you, have a, do you have a view on that? Do you have a view on the appropriateness of that in the context of complex issues around rule of law and independence? Well, you know, many, um, I do a lot of admin tribunal work, and so most tribunals, uh, whether it's medical or whatever it is, often have public members being members of those tribunals. Uh, you know, my experience has been they generally don't know what's going on because it's, it's foreign, right? It, part of the, the tribunal is their unique expertise. But I think members of the public uh, being a witness to it and, and being involved in some way is has validity. I, I think it, it causes uh, the regulators to be a little bit um, more cautious, less clubby, uh, and to be reminded of their role and their obligation to the public. So I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. Um, and, you know, in terms of defining the public interest, well, I think it's the public interest vis-a-vis -vis a lawyer, and we know what that is. It's not the public interest vis-a-vis -vis what your personal interest is. It's what we expect lawyers to do, their obligations, their ethics, uh, and that is something that uh, lawyers are definitely uniquely qualified to to regulate and divine. Um, so I, I, I think having the public involved in the process demystifies it and perhaps makes it a little bit less clubby. I, I, I mean, beyond that, I'm not sure how much practical value it adds. Mm, thank you. I see I have a person with a question, uh, please. Uh... <clears throat> thank you. I'm, I'm not sure if I have to turn this on. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank thanks. Uh, my name is Nadia Farinelli. I'm a Crown Prosecutor here in Vancouver. That was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Earlier this week in the confirmation hearings, or last week for um, Judge Jackson, she was asked about her views on constitutional interpretation right. and whether she, she subscribed uh, to an originalist approach, which right. she confirmed that, that she would apply an interpretation of the Constitution that was consistent with the founding father's intent, mm -hmm. in essence. Mm -hmm. and, and that was sort of, that's seen as a sort of conservative viewpoint um, in the debate in the US between judicial activism and originalism. Yes. I'm wondering to what extent do you think that debate manifests in Canada? I've always thought that our living tree doctrine and approach to judicial activism was different and more liberal. I don't know if you see that being challenged and how we are different than the US in that regard. Well, she I, she did reference Scalia in particular, who who was the uh, uh, a big promoter of that originalist interpretation, where you don't go beyond the text and the plain plain meaning. I, I think she sort of qualified her answer a little bit, to be honest. Um, uh, I think I, I think characterizing judges as activist is is really again uh, rhetoric that uh, the the right really likes to attach to, and it's wrong. Uh, because the law has to not be activists, but judges have to live in the current time. And that means that things that you had not foreseen at the time the Constitution was, was passed uh, are, are things now that, that exist uh, and that you have to consider. Technology advances, and that means that you're going to look, for example, um, uh, at the right to privacy or unreasonable search and seizure in a bit of a different way. We didn't have iPhones in 1982 when I was in law school. Um, and so we look at it differently. So that doesn't mean that a judge is activist because they now look at the law of search and seizure and what's constitutional and what's not and look at it in the context of how we are living today. The other thing is obviously we, I hope, uh, advance our thinking about certain things. A really good example would be uh, looking at um, uh, for example, the decriminalization of, of marijuana or the right to die or uh, abortion rights or all of those things where, you know, maybe in 1800, it wasn't relevant, but now we have a different understanding and a different awareness. And so judges have to be present in our society. They cannot live and adjudicate as though they don't exist here and that we haven't evolved in any, any sort of way. So I, I don't find those activist uh, labels uh, accurate. I think they're designed to be incendiary and inflammatory and to scare people and to suggest to them judges are doing something that they have no authority to do. Um, and I, I don't think so. Now in Canada, we do have a, a, a different approach to the Constitution. First of all, it's much younger. Um, and, and we have this notion of the living tree and we have been much more progressive. Uh, you know, nobody, no, no, the world did not stop when Morgan Toller was decided. And the world did not stop when we had, you know, decriminalized prostitution or right to, or all the sorts of things we do in our very conservative Canadian way. Um, we survived as a, as a community. And I don't think those judges were activists. They were looking at our society and applying the law in our society today as we choose to live. And we have to remember the law is not um, divorced from our, our, our concepts of how we function as a society, how we interact with each other, our morality, all of that. And so that has to be reflected in, in, in how, we look at, uh, how we look at laws. Great question, thank you. Do we have another question? Yeah. Thank you. My name is Elsa Wiley. I'm a criminal yes. defense lawyer um, here. I recently completed my LLM in the States in 2019. And so I understand the appeal of talking about the rule of law in the juxtaposition of the Americans. But as I returned to Canada, I started to take a look at what lawyers were doing about the rule of law in Canada, and particularly the judiciary, and particularly the fact that we haven't had an Indigenous justice on the Supreme Court of Canada. And I think white lawyers, myself included, need to do a better job of having these conversations. And I was curious about your perspectives. I hear a lot about hopes and dreams of having an Indigenous um, justice on the Supreme Court of Canada, but with the um, 
with the bilingual requirement, which means French and English and doesn't mean French in an in indigenous language, and with the various what are your contributions to the law and what the test of contributions to the law is, I'm wondering if you can comment about the barriers and the challenges Canada faces in the rule of law. As it relates in particular to indigenous, the indigenous yeah. community, I mean, the and barriers representation. are barriers that we created right. uh, when we attempted to a genocide of, of the indigenous community. And so is it a surprise that you now are looking to, uh, to find people? We don't open uh, the corridors. Um, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of different, um, again, it's about answer, asking the right question. Of, and you have asked the right question, but I think we have to step back. You know, when we look at, for example, representation of women in law schools and we say, bravo, it's 50%. Well, first of all, it's, it's only 50% of a particular demographic. Uh, so racialized women are not represented, indigenous women are not well represented. So that 50% only relates to a very particular demographic. And we know that that 50%, by the time you get up to the partnership level, we're down to 13%. So if we want to solve the problem of female partners staying in the profession, that's one question that has to be asked and answered. If we want to solve the problem of, of having more racialized and indigenous people in law school, we have to look at, uh, if we're asking that question, the answer is different. The answer relates to the admission uh, in law school, what we do, what we do to uh, promote and open those corridors and access to Indigenous students and um, racialized students. So th the answer there is, you know, at the law school door and probably before that to, to develop that. I think representation is extremely important because in the justice system, because we see ourselves uh, in the lawyers and in the judges who judge us. And having Indigenous representation on the Supreme Court is long overdue. It's shameful, um, in my view. Uh, but having Indigenous representation throughout the justice system, other than in the jails, which we are very good at ensuring representation there, um, is, is something we need to correct. Uh, it is our, our one of our most significant uh, painful failings in this, in this country, and we should be profoundly ashamed of ourselves. I mean, there's no other way to, to, uh, to characterize it. Thanks very much. Next question. So I have a question that comes from online, and uh, it was somebody who said, I just finished your book and really enjoyed it. Thank you. Can you comment on the impact of the Me Too movement on the presumption of innocence as you see it? Yes, um, it, it, it uh, doesn't impact the presumption of innocence. It's alive and well. Um, you know, people talk about the court of public opinion, which is not a courtroom. Uh, there are no judges, and uh, that's not new. People have had um, to deal with public responses in, in a public forum. But the courtroom still has the presumption of innocence. Uh, it is not lost in these cases. Uh, you know, you try many cases. Judges are very careful of uh, applying those principles. And uh, I think, you know, the Me Too movement was more born out of necessity. Uh, it was to bring to the fore an issue that had been buried, had not been addressed effectively. Uh, I think those two things, having a, a robust justice system and having that movement that does something necessary is not inconsistent. Yeah, I think that's so interesting because you often hear criticisms of the legal system that, you know, a, a person from 1850 could walk into a courtroom and pretty much find their way around, whereas a medical doctor couldn't do the same thing. And yet, I think there are some core components of the justice system which should stay, no matter if we're in 2022 or if we're in 2080. Uh, and I, I guess the question I wanted to ask you, and, and again, to tie it back a little bit with connecting the, the cause with the lawyers in your career, and you and I are similar vintage, uh, you know, have you seen that change? Have you seen this court of public opinion change and impact on, on that kind of feel of how much scrutiny there is on a criminal defense lawyer, for example? Sure. I mean, I'm not the first criminal defense lawyer to do the cases that I do. Um, at least I didn't think I was. Um, but you know, when you look at how uh, lawyers were even portrayed in, in the media, uh, yeah, I think of To Kill a Mockingbird, I, I think of all the, the ways that you would see lawyers represented and it was viewed as, as being a, a good profession and an honorable thing and you did not conflate the 
uh, the lawyer with their with their client. You did not assume they were carrying on a cause. Um, and that has changed dramatically. I mean, that's why you get um, the sorts of questioning we saw with this with this judge in the United States. It is conflating her, desperately trying to conflate her with her clients. Um, and it's why you see the commentary in the UK. It's why you see the sorts of things we've heard here in Canada. And that is very, uh, very dangerous. I, I mean, I was actually looking at, um, you know, you mentioned it. Uh, I was looking at the United Nations uh, principles on the role of lawyers. And one of the principles is this, I'm gonna read it to you. It's actually a principle. Lawyers shall not be identified with their clients or their clients' causes as a result of discharging their functions. And the United Nations thought it was sufficient and important enough to put that in as a principle in defining the role of lawyers. And you know anybody who knows anything about what we do knows that to be true. Um, but again, I, I think there's been a lot of misinformation and uh, we need to do a better job of explaining what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the group? We're, we're quickly approaching, oh, we're, here we are. Next question, please. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. It's been a privilege to have you with us. Thank, thank you. you. Um, the question I have is, well, like I 100% I agree that the wrong questions um, are asked most of the time. And I guess my question to you is, is what do we do as individuals or what does that person do? You know, you have to, Answer or do you not answer the question, or do you answer the question? Or like, what what role can we play in changing those questions? Well, you, you that that's a great question, and and you can play a role. I mean, you can speak to high school students, you can engage the public, you can write about what we do, you can write about when there are tough cases, why it is we're doing what we're doing. You can remind the public of our, the lessons, the historical lessons, because again, we're not reinventing things here. We know what happens when you muzzle lawyers, when you muzzle judges, when you try to interfere. We've seen the history lessons. You can go to Germany to know, you can see Russia, I mean, all over the world. So I think we have to bring that to the fore and, and, and try to engage with members of the public in a way that it's understandable. But the other thing also is often, you know, when someone says to you, why do you do what, they, what you do? I think you have to um, drill down a little bit and, and engage with what it is that you're asking. Like, what is it that you are specific, what, what is troubling you? You know, is it a particular type of case? Is it what I do in court? And I think when you engage in those conversations, you can get at what the real question is, because often it's not, you know, it, that's a pretty superficial question and, and you need to uh, dig a little bit um, to understand what it is that is the cause of concern or, or where the question is, is coming from. And I've just, I found those conversations, I have to say, really um, productive and, and really enlightening. I don't think members of the public are stupid. I think they're very smart. And I think when you, when you see what we do in court, when you invite them to come and watch, I mean, I always say, come and watch and see what's happening. Um, when you open it up, there is a reason for the open court principle. People walk away with a much better impression of it. Again, not that we don't have flaws, we do, but I think they, they appreciate a little bit more what, what goes into what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. And that it's not so obvious all the time. It's not that clear sometimes. Good advice, thank you. Thanks very much, great question. Any other questions from the room? We are now 10 after seven, so we're, getting, we're nearing the end uh, of, uh, of our session. I would like to, to pick up a little bit on what you just said, and I think that we can be a bit clubby as a profession, sure. and inviting people in, and inviting people in to understand what these fundamental principles are and how they actually affect them in real life on yep. the ground uh, is so important. So you've given some good suggestions about how to do some of that outreach and how to yeah, I, I think we have to do that as a profession. I think we have to also be less clubby in our profession. That would be helpful. So rep again, I go back to this, but representation in the profession is extremely important because members of the public see themselves through through us. And when they see an Indigenous person on the Supreme Court, when they see a female lawyer, when they, when they see us in the profession and we make it less clubby, it becomes, uh, I think, a little bit more reflective of the society we live in.
Because the rule of law is for all of us, benefits all of us. It's it's not just a, a theory that exists within the legal system. It's Every single person, and, and I, I watched, I believe it was your interview with Peter Mansbridge mm -hmm. on The National, where you talked about every single person who's sitting in your office doesn't want to be there. There are all kinds of unwilling participants in the justice system, and you never know when that might happen to no, you. Nobody's been happy to be in my office. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they've been happy to be in your office, but not for the underlying cause. Okay, any any questions? Anyone want to make some observations? Okay, well, what a wonderful night. Thank uh, you. Marie, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Wow, what a fabulous, fabulous discussion. Thank you so very much, Marie, for joining us and coming all the way to talk about the rule of law. We really, on behalf of everybody here and, and online, we really, really appreciate it. Another round of applause for Marie. And I think we, we also want to thank you for, for the hard work that you do on a daily basis as defense counsel. Absolutely not an easy role, and you are doing your part with your heart and your brain and your lot of courage uh, to uh, protect the public and protect your clients in a very vigorous and strong and way to be very proud of that. So thank you so much for what you do. And thank you to all of you who have attended uh, the fourth uh, lecture in the Rule of Law series. We hope to uh, make it annual again, so I hope to see you next year. And thanks to those who participated online. Um, wonderful to see you, and, and take care, and, and be safe.